So I'm just going to use a case review now to illustrate some of these processes. So what we're just talking about, this diagnosis and the site of the, of the case review of, of John for the site and the direction of our loss movement choices, our control issues. So John is a patient of mine when I used to live in Edinburgh, he's a 45 year old taxi driver. He has a five year history of recurrent lumbar pain following a lifting injury, you know, lifting a heavy bag into his taxi. Yeah, he currently has four episodes of acute back pain a year, acute back pain and spasm, requiring some time off work. It usually takes, at the moment, takes it two to three weeks to settle. Yeah, these, but he also states that the episodes are getting worse, they're lasting longer and becoming more frequent. So he's sort of starting to recognise that this is going in the wrong direction. Also, he has a general backache every day. Yeah, so even, if, even, when he doesn't, when, even when he doesn't have these acute episodes, every day at the end of the day, he's got a general backache. And he's worried about his ability to keep his job. You know, he's thinking, yeah, he's 45 years old. Yeah, he's, he's been doing this all his life. He, he, like, he loves his job, but he's just thinking, you know, what happens if he, can't make, if he can't earn his livelihood anymore? So if we look at his pain, his pain presents with an intermittent deep dull ache across the lower lumbar spine. Okay, it's deep, dull, vague. Okay, you know, central radiating both sides a little bit. Okay, it's poorly localized. Yeah, it's not as if it's like one spot. It's just he, put, he, he identifies it by putting his whole hand rubbing across his back, and he has no referral into the buttocks. It's just this pain at the lumbosacral junction. So when we look at asking what sort of things provoke his symptoms, increase his symptoms, prolonged sitting, especially for an hour, driving, bending and lifting. So he's identifying that flexion activities and postures are his provoking movement. So we're seeing a biomechanical link here. Flexion is his provoking movement. And then when we ask him what sort of things can help ease, ease your symptoms or decrease them, standing, walking, lying flat on the floor, back arching, you know, getting out of his cab and standing up and arching his back. So he's, he's, he's got a very clear picture of flexion is, provo is a provoking movement, extension is a relieving movement. Okay, just a bit of other information, you know, in the mornings, he, he, he wakes up with a little bit of morning stiffness, but it only takes five minutes to loosen up. So, you know, it doesn't take long to loosen up. And so that gives a bit of indication, you know, that, that you know, he's not too bad. He can get, gets, he gets moving very quickly. As the, it gets worse at the end of the day if he's driving his taxi because he's sitting in flexion. Uh, his sleep's not disturbed. Anti-inflammatories help his symptoms a lot. And radiology shows some minor degenerative changes at L3, 4, 4, 5 and S1, okay. So, but, but he's giving us a clue here. He's giving us a clue that his symptoms, okay, are not are not significantly degenerative, but they're inflammatory. They're they're they're, no, they're inflammatory. They're helped by um that they help they help by any inflammatory medications. He rests and he can be he can be better. He's worse at the end of the day, and he's got a bit a bit of slight morning stiffness. So yeah, minor degenerative changes, but he's got an inflammatory yeah peripheral nociceptive pain mechanism. He's giving us a clue to that one. Let me look at his functional movement assessment. His, his standing posture is a sway back posture. That means he stands with his hips pushed forward and his, and his upper body swayed back. So he's got a long kyphosis, extends down to L3, then he's got a short lordosis, and his pelvis is in posterior tilt. So the sway back posture <coughs> stands, yeah, with the pelvis pushed forward into posterior tilt, chest swayed back, hanging on his hip flexors, okay, and his abdominals are elongated, and his lumbar spine is segmentally extending at the lumbar, lumbar sacral junction. But when we look at his flexion movements, his flexion is hypermobile range, but no pain and functional movements. But if we put a bit of overpressure and add extra extra pressure to it, he um uh, he gets he gets a bit of um um uh, slight pain. Okay, uh, he's got a slight decrease of hip flexion. Extension range is good range. With decreased upper lumbar mobility, he's a bit stiff in his upper lumbar and thoracic lumbar junction, and he gets a skin crease at L5. So he's sort of like he's that's classic with sway back postures. They've got a long kyphosis and it's often often a little bit stiff. Okay, but and he, but he's got a skin crease at L5, but he's got no pain with extension. So even though it doesn't necessarily look good, it's his still remember that's his pain relieving movement. Flexion's his pain provocative movement. And when we look at side bending, he's, it says he's got good range, but it feels a bit tight. Yeah, and same with rotation. He's got good range, normal range, but it just says it feels a little bit tight, but there's no real loss of range of motion. 
when we look at his palpation, looking at his sp a spinal joint palpation, his L1 to L3, his upper lumbar spine is stiff when we push it in an anterior posterior direction. So, so in, in, into, a, into an anterior direction. So in a PA or from a posterior to anterior direction, sorry, when we push on it and put, try to push it forward, it's stiff, but he says it feels good to push on. Okay. His L5 central, putting pushing on L5 centrally in a posterior to anterior direction. So as a loose end feel with slight tenderness. But when we look at L3 to 5 in terms of reflection, PIPM or passive physiological inevitable motion. So looking at his ability to, when we passively flex him through range, okay, his low lumbar spine is hypermobile and it's got slight pain when we push on it. And that's the important one. That's the one that matches his symptoms. He's got increased flexion range passively when we test it as well and, in, um, and with pain sensitivity and end range when we flex his low lumbar spine and that's where he gets his symptoms. Neurological, neurodynamic issues are non-significant. He's got no referred symptoms. He's got no positive neurodynamic or, neuro, or neurological signs. So if we think of then his diagnosis, of, diagnosis, if we start looking at his diagnosis of kinesiopathology, we want to come up with a diagnosis of sight and direction of his lost movement choices or uncontrolled movements. Okay. So let's look at that. Yeah. When we look at his lumbar pelvic direction control testing, looking for his slight direction of lost movement choice or his un uncontrolled movements. When we tested his lumbar flexion control, there were three tests he failed, standing bow. So these are tests of can you control or prevent lumbar flexion while you flex somewhere else or create a flexion stress in the lumbar spine, you move somewhere else. And so the standing bow, the four point rocking backwards or the sitting double knee bend, okay? So these are the tests he failed. So what I just want to demonstrate now is just quickly show you these tests. Uh, from the from the from the from the movement catalog. So if I just now um, bring up, so this is the, this is the, this is the uh, our, our, our movement website, Camera Movement Science, and then yeah you know, here we can find the kinetic control pages or the the, the performance matrix or the movement science practitioner pages or the, the uh, CMS online. But once 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 you've set up an account, uh, and uh, we'll talk this about this, but we've got an exercise catalog that you can log into. Okay, and you and if you haven't already got one of these, uh, or you haven't already had a look at it, you can sign up for a free trial. Uh, but I'll show you as we, uh, towards the end of the, the end of the lecture how to, where we where we sign up for that. But if we go and look at so for John, we look at lumbar pelvic flexion control. So if we look at here we're looking at the different sites and directions that we might want to test for. So we can look at we can look at cervical site and directions, thoracic site and directions, scapular site and directions, glenohumeral site and directions, lumbar pelvic site and directions, or hip. So if we look at lumbar pelvic flexion, if we look at tests of movement control, if I highlight that. And then search. Uh, the movement test. Can you bend forward? The benchmark range is 50 degrees forward leaning and prevent lumbar flexion, cognitively control lumbar flexion while you flex at the hips to that benchmark range. Yeah. And so, and uh, and th this has uh, the text in in French, in uh, French, English, Spanish, and Finnish. Uh, unfortunately, um, we don't have Chinese yet. <laughs> but um, but if you're here. And if you hear if you hear from China or, or Taiwan or one of the Chinese speaking countries, you obviously you can obviously you can um, <laughs> read a bit of English or, or understand English. But um, uh, but we don't have we don't have this in the, the Chinese and the Chinese text at the moment. But the, the but the kinetic control book uh, has a, has a Chinese option as well now. Um, so if I come back out of this now, okay. Uh, what I'll, I'll what I'll do is just to, just to speed this up, I'll just demonstrate these next two. But so, so, so the four point test that John failed was can you start on hands and knees? And then can you keep the lumbar spine from flexing right back to at least 100, 120 degrees hip flexion or halfway back without letting the spine lose its shallow lordosis or posterior tilt? Into lumbar flexion, and then the second test that John the taxi driver failed was the um, uh, sitting double knee extension. So 
the test for this one is can can you maintain a shallow lord doses trunk upright and can you extend both knees without letting the back collapse into lumbar flexion the benchmark for this is to extend to within 10 degrees of full extension of the knees so full extension of the knees is not the benchmark 10 de degrees short of full extension is the benchmark for that test so but these are the tests that john the taxi driver failed see so he failed three significant flexion control tests he also failed one of the extension control tests at a tick and cross level so a tick and cross fail is a minor fail two crosses is, is more significant and we'll discuss this scoring system a little bit later but um but he failed one extension control test so when he stands and tries to do thoracic extension can he stop the lumbar spine hinging at the lumbar sacral junction he he could but with high effort it, he needed feedback to control that but he could control it with feedback but so that was that was something he failed there but again this is if we think of priorities this is less of a priority because extension is not his is extension is not his pain producing movement flexion is his pain producing movement and we also looked at lumbar rotation control you know test of bent knee fallout bkfo stands for bent knee fallout so can you prevent i'll just demonstrate this one as well it's going to be easy to do so can you while lying control the pelvis and prevent the pelvis from rotating while your hip laterally rotates out laterally rotates the ducts and the benchmark range here is 45 degrees okay and can you rotate out to the side and back in without the pelvis rotating to follow the hip movement so can you cognitively control the lumbar pelvic rotation while you move the hip through a component of rotation and so these are the tests and again john the taxi driver could control that but needed feedback to control it so the priority here though is that yeah you know, even though he failed more than one test and he failed some extension and rotation controls to a minor level okay they they are clinically low risk low priority okay his symptoms are flexion linked so that's why we want we want to make a link a link to, to the the movement control impairments so the loss of movement choices that relate to the symptoms and these are the clear problems so john's diagnosis of loss of movement choice in terms of the sight and direction is lumbar flexion that's his problem movement and that's his clinical priority now then if we look at other components of this looking at his ability for his muscles that have a global stabilizer role to effectively control this so when we looked at is is is, is stabilizer muscles uh, we've got a, a testing process is looking at the testing the efficient recruitment efficiency of these muscles we have a test for it and i'll go through the process as we go along but his back extensor stabilizers his superficial multipedis failed the ability to to um to demonstrate recruitment efficiency into a shortened range his iliacus failed that recruitment test and his gluteus maximus failed so these three muscles in particular failed recruitment efficiency tests of uh, uh, these stabilizer muscles and so but it which ones are important for someone with a flexion problem well these two because the back extensor muscles are muscles that can when they cognitively activate or when they show have good recruitment efficiency can limit or or, or isometrically control isometrically limit or eccentrically control lumbar flexion so these are important for flexion control iliacus is also a very important muscle for flexion control of the lumbar spine okay whereas gluteus maximus is the muscle that produces posterior tilt of the pelvis so that's not the good guy just because it's inefficient just because he's got some postural inefficiencies doesn't mean that the gluteus maximus is the important muscle to him for him to retrain because active, making his gluteus maximus work more efficiently is not going to prevent posterior tilt of the pelvis it's going to cause posterior tilt of the pelvis his uncontrolled movement is lumbar spine flexion and posterior tilt of the pelvis so we need to train these muscles the back extensor stabilizing the iliacus and iliacus and again just a quick little demonstration testing for iliacus is sitting now iliacus tests can you flex without flexing the spine or leaning backwards can you flex the hip To the range you have passively available so 110 odd degrees or more if you're a dancer 
But whatever range you've got, can you actively use your iliacus and hip tennis to get the spine hip to flex without leaning back or posterior tilting the pelvis? So, because iliacus is a muscle of anterior tilt, it can eccentrically control posterior tilt, it can isometrically resist posterior tilt and lumbar flexion. It'll maintain a lordo help us maintain a lordosis in sitting. So if you've got someone who's got flexion symptoms in sitting, the most important muscle to start retraining after you've got some cognitive control of your sight and direction is iliacus because it'll help maintain your ability to posturally don't sag into posterior tilt and lumbar flexion while you're sitting. And then also, if we look at the mobilizer muscles that might be contributing to problems. Are there restrictions that are contributing to lumbar flexion as compensation? And when we looked at John, the taxi driver, the, the two muscles that, that were particularly had lost extensibility were the hamstrings and the tensor fascia lata iliotibial band. But the one that's relevant here is the hamstrings because limit, hamstrings limit hip flexion. And so then he, you compensate with hip, you compensate for your limited, you compensate for your relatively stiff hip flexion with increased lumbar flexion. So the hamstrings are directly related to his diagnosis of lumbar flexion, loss of movement choice or movement control impairments. Whereas the tensor fascia lata and iliotibular band don't directly contribute to that. Okay, they're a bit tight, they're posturally tight as part of his sway back posture. They're useful to work on. So we want to do something about these because they do cause compensations in other places. But the tensor fascia lata and iliotibular band causes lumbar extension as a compensation, not lumbar flexion. And the TFL ITB, okay, even though he, and even though he failed one test of flex extension control, extension is still his relieving movement. So even though that's a problem, okay, it's a low priority problem. And the hamstrings are the clear priority to work on here. And then when we looked at his local stabilizer recruitment efficiency, looking at his transversus abdominis, his segmental lumbar multifidus, and his and his uh, posterior fascicles of psoas major, okay. The transversus and multifidus demonstrated inefficient recruitment. And so somewhere along the line, we want to retrain these muscles too because they're linked. Uh, failure to recover local stabilizer recruitment efficiency is linked to recurrence, and he's got a history of recurrence. Okay. The psoas, on the other hand, uh, passed its test of recruitment efficiency for local stabilizer translation control, and so we don't need to do any work on that. So looking at John the taxi driver then. If we look at his diagnosis of lost movement choice, his sight and direction is lumbar flexion. Okay, that's diagnosis number one. Now then as part of this diagnosis, we then also need to go to, you know, what are we gonna do about it? Movement recovery planning. So we need to, this is, this is sort of a table, a box, to sort of think, looking at now movement control problems. How, what, where are the priorities? So for John, his lost movement choice is lumbar flexion. And so what are we going to work on? Well. These are the tests he failed. So these are the tests, by, by, the tests you fail can become retraining strategies. They, these are lost movement choices. So we can train people to do these movements until they can recover them, until they can control them to benchmark standards. And by the time they, they can stand and prevent lumbar flexion, control or prevent lumbar flexion and, and hinge forward at the hips to 50 degrees, by the time they can rock backwards and prevent lumbar flexion while they get to 120 degrees hip flexion, by the time they can extend his knees, okay, get past his hamstring restriction and prevent lumbar flexion as compensation for those hamstrings, then then, th then he's going to start changing symptoms associated with this as well because the cognitive control gets better. So that's part of his treatment plan is to, is to get train his posterior stabilizer muscles to become efficient enough so that they can control lumbar flexion while he performs these movement control tests. The most global stabilizer muscles that we need to retrain, the, the back extensor stabilizers, the superficial multifidus needs to be able to be, become efficient. The iliacus needs to become efficient so they can prevent posterior tilt. They can prevent lumbar extension while you, uh, and, and, maintain, uh, as, and, and, can, and maintain the, uh, the spinal position of, uh, of low stress, mid range. We also need to make sure these hamstrings regain extensibility because while those hamstrings are a restriction, they're going to cause lumbar flexion as compensation in some functional activities and functional movements. And then also the local stabilizers. He's got a history of recurrence. So we need to retrain these muscles to recover somewhere along the line in our rehab plan. Okay. And so which which what what do these things we prioritize depends on sort of our 
um, our thinking, our clinical reasoning as we go along. But what we're making a, a list of all the things that we have to fix to sort this problem out. And there's no particular restrictions that cause lumbar flexion. Uh, yeah, his little his, his thoracic spine, thoracic lumbar spine that's a bit stiff when he extends, uh, doesn't cause lumbar flexion as compensation. So there's no high priority manual mobilization. But anything that feels good to mobilize is still something you'd probably do clinically. But in terms of in terms of retraining control of lumbar flexion, that's cause of that's cause of his recurrent problem. These boxes that we filled in are the key points. Now we can't, we're obviously not going to fix all this in one go. So we want to try and prioritize where do we start, where do we progress to in, in terms of dealing with these these issues as we go along. But that's something that we that we um we'll try and we'll come come up with some ideas as we go along a little bit further. Okay, so now then our second diagnosis is the diagnosis of pathoanatomy. So for John, we want to try and identify what are his pain sensitive or pain generating tissues. Now, in our, uh, in our clinical judgment masterclass, we go through this in a lot more detail. So we go through lots of different types of tissues and, and, and try and Come up with, come up with, and give a good example. Give good descriptions of the clinical presentation of, you know, disc pain or capsule pain or tendon pain or trigger point pain or muscle uh, injury pain. So, or degenerative joint pain versus uh, acute joint pain. Um, so we, we go through all these details of trying to put, trying to really sort of fine tune our understanding of the clinical picture of these pain patterns, but how different tissues present when they when they're pathological. But then also then try to work out the clinical reasoning framework to decide whether they're involved in this particular person's uh, problem. So, so you know, I'm, I'm going to do a little bit of a summary of this, but but uh, but in the clinical judgment masterclass, we, we go through this whole process, the clinical reasoning behind identifying the symptom generating tissues in a lot more detail. But basically, it's a process of doing detective work. You know, part of the detective work is to you know, eliminate suspects. So the thing is you round up, round up all the usual suspects. So we want to look at, well, what are the possible tissues that might be relevant for John's pain? Who has an alibi? So which structures are not likely to be there based on some other questions of, of, of clinical questions we're going to ask? And then which structures actually, which structures have previous forms? So which structures are known to produce similar symptoms to this that John's complaining of? So there's four questions we want to ask. Number one, what are the possible tissues? Okay. Yeah, what are the possible tissues that could be responsible for symptoms for John the taxi driver? So it's tissues that are located in the area or can refer to the area. Number two, is the pain localized? Okay, so when the, when the, when the patient described, do they point with one finger or thumb to say my pain comes from here or comes from here or you know, like someone's got an ankle sprain, they point right to their anterior talofibular ligament saying this is where my pain is, okay? So when pain is highly localized, when patients localize their pain and point with one finger or thumb, okay, that, that means pain, that pain is coming from highly innovative tissues. The central, the central nervous system has a very clear cortical map of structures that are highly innovated, much more precise versus when people can describe their pain as non-specific or vague. So they, they, they describe their pain as being with one hand, so a big area. So they, they, they don't localize the pain. It's a, it's a broad, vague, non-specific area. Then pain is coming from poorly innovative tissues because the central nervous system's map, it's, it's, it's map of where of, of different structures is, is a lot more vague for poorly innovative tissues or, or if the pain is referred. The third question we ask is, does the mechanism of pain provocation link to the tissue loading history or the tissue's mechanism of injury, a, me a mechanism of injury? Okay. And then number four, does the pain distribution that the patient's got, got match the suspected tissues? So let's just go through this, just go through this for John, the taxi driver. So, you know, the first question is, what are the possible tissues in the right location that could be responsible for the patient's pain? Well, Nick Bogdock stated that any innovative tissue is a potential source of pain. So what are the innovative tissues in the, in the musculoskeletal system? So if we just think as a gesture, what is the whole gamut? joint capsules, ligaments, tendons, muscle, muscle fascias, nerves, dural tissue, periosteum and bone, skin and subcutaneous fascia, visceral fascias, they're all innovated and they can produce pain. Articular cartilage, discs or unconvertible joints yeah, that, form, that form within the cervical disc, labrums, menisci, 
lobe transfer fascias like the iliotibial band or the thoracic lumbar fascia, you know, they develop nociceptor threshold. Uh, the nociceptor threshold for these tissues changes if they're inflamed or injured. Versus, okay, again, they're not normally pain sensitive in, in mostly, but they, they become nociceptive because nociceptor threshold changes if they're inflamed or injured or damaged. So what we've got is a big list of innovative tissues, okay, that are the sources of pain. Now, which ones of these does John have in the lumbar spine? Well, we can eliminate unconvertible joints. We don't have them in the lumbar spine. We can eliminate labrums. They don't have them in the lumbar spine. We can eliminate menisci. We don't have them in the lumbar spine. Okay. Now, back to back to here. Um, so, so, so what we've done is a bit of detective work. And we've eliminated some suspects now from John. Okay. Now then. What's the, our next question is, what are the highly localized, uh, what are the highly innovative tissues versus the poorly innovative tissues with the tissues contributing to referral? So now I've just subgrouped all these tissues in terms of the highly innovative tissues. So joint capsules, are, when people have capsule pain, they, can, they, they point to the, where the injury is, ligaments, tendons, muscles, muscle fascias, yeah. So, so nerves, yeah, again, they'll point to where the nerve is caught or impinged. Um, so all these tissues are highly innovated. You know, if you fracture the bone, people point to where the bone's fractured. If you've got a stress fracture, they'll point to that. So these, these all these tissues are highly innovated. Okay, and they'll tend to point to the area. Whereas articular cartilage, okay, generally is something where people will start describe it's it's all it's all through my elbow, or they go all around the knee. You know, so if you've got if you've got degenerative articular cartilage injuries, you know, it's poorly localized. Labrums don't localize to one little spot. Meniscus tend to be sort of like this deep joint line pain, you know. Uh, load transfer fascias when inflamed just be, is a pain that spreads along the bands. Uh, bursas tend to be a, a thing where it's like an ache that spreads out rather than just one spot. Um, uh, yeah, and, and, and bursas tend to refer a little bit too. Uh, they have some connective tissue referral. And then tissues that can produce referred pain are trigger points. Uh, neurodynamic tissues, dura can produce some. Some of these highly innovative tissues can also be, produce preferred pain as well. Neurofascial pain, where nerves pass through fascial interfaces, and nerve compression issues, connective tissues can, particularly capsules, can refer outside of the areas as well, and viscerous can refer. So what we've got is sub, sub, just subgrouping of tissues in, term, in terms of highly innovative, which, which we would look for if someone, if someone pointed with one finger to their pain versus poorly innovated or referred. So if we now take this to John, okay, his, his symptoms are, are, are vague, non-specific. So he we're talking about poorly innovated tissues or referred pain sources. So now we can start to innovate, we can, we can probably eliminate for John a lot of these highly innovated structures, okay. And so we've already innovate, eliminated the unconvertible joint labrum and this guy, but what's left now are articular cartilages and discs and the thoracic lumbar fascia or load transfer fascia in the lumbar spine. And a lot of these referred areas, they, these things can all produce, these things are all potentially able to refer pain into the area where John has his symptoms. Okay, so we still haven't eliminated all of these just yet, but because all of these areas can produce pain in the area where John has his symptoms. And they'll produce a vague sort of pain as well. Not, not highly, because referred pain is never localized. Okay, now then the next question, question then is, you know, um, yeah, which, which are the tissues that link to his site, to the mechanism of provocation and relief? So yeah, he's got flexion, provocation and extension relief. So if we start looking at these now, okay, we eliminated all these ones before, but what else can we eliminate now? Well, now we can eliminate articular cartilage, okay? Because articular cartilage is in the lumbar spine, the facet joints are, are, tend to be more extension provoked and flexion relieved rather than flexion provoked and extension relief. So these, so we eliminate articular cartilage. We can also eliminate myofascial trigger points. Myofascial trigger points don't tend to be sort of you know, movement provoked and movement relieved. They tend to be more static position. And the visceral pain, visceral stuff tends to not be flexion provoked and extension relieved. It tends to be sort of sits there in the background of flexion extension. So we're now seeing that, you know, we're eliminating a few more structures based on the idea that it's, it's a mechanical pain that's flexion provoked and extension relieved. Then a final question is, you know, uh, remaining tissues that match the pain and nature, uh, the pain nature and distribution. Okay, so which tissues match John's pain nature? So what he's got is a central pain, deep dilate that radiates bilaterally. Okay, and so 
what we now do, load transfer fascia. So thyroid type of fascia doesn't give central pain that radiates by that, but it tends to be more unilateral pain or it tends to radiate up and down the thyroid lumbar fascia. Uh, so we can eliminate that. A neurodynamic sensitization tends to refer distally, so it refers out of the, out of the spine as well. The dural sensitization refers out of the spine into the into the, uh, the periphery. Neurofascial pain, okay, is not central. It's 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 nearly always it's always asymmetrical or unilateral. Nerve compression pain refers out of the area, okay. Connective tissues such as capsules tend to refer one side or the other. So we can now eliminate pretty much all of those referred pain mechanisms too. And so what we're left with for John the taxi driver, okay, is the disc. So you know, so I've kept him as a, I've used him as a very good example because he does have one primary, you know, based on a process of good detective work, you know, one tissue left, and his disc ticks all the boxes, yeah, you know, for being his source of symptoms. Okay. So in John the taxi driver, okay, you know, we do know that it actually is a disc this time. <laughs> yeah, but yeah, you know, but that's what they so we've now got a diagnosis, our second diagnosis. The L5S1 disc is his uh, is his primary um, a source of symptoms or his, his pathoanatomy. Now then, in terms of the pain mechanism and evaluating context contextual factors, okay, yeah. Um, now we don't have in the scope of this one to go through the clinical you know, differentiation between peripheral and central neurogenic and a lot of the psycho behavioral sort of stuff, but John has got a very clear picture of having a mechanical inflammatory pain sense, no peripheral nociceptive pain mechanism. It's provoked by flexion, relieved by extension. He's, it's, it, it's got a bit of morning stiffness. It's relieved by an inflammatory medication. Okay, it's, yeah, and so he's clearly got a nociceptive pain mechanism uh, uh, associated with his pain and his acute flare-ups are gonna be the same sort of thing as well. So, and he doesn't have any clinical signs that are significant for peripheral or central neurogenic sensitization. Yeah. And, and, and from a behavioral psychosocial amplifiers, we could start to think, well, maybe he's scared about keeping his job. So we could maybe put a question mark around here about his bit of anxiety about keeping his job because yeah, he's looking at where to go. But um, but in reality, sort of, yeah, he's got a mechanical problem. It's just that he, he he's not very good at working out how to control it or, or stop, stop a, a, a pro, prolonged and ongoing mechanism of stirring it and flaring it up. He's got lumbar flexion. He's got a job that spends a lot of time in lumbar flexion. Uh -huh. Righto. Um, just the other thing, just the, in terms of looking at environmental and behavioral contextual factors. So the things that we want to consider are there ergonomic and occupational workplace issues, postural triggers, environmental issues, personal lifestyle habits or emotional triggers. And for John in particular, these two would stand out, you know. One of the things that we that I, I suggested to him is that you know he um uh, he get a back support for his cab and he says I've tried that it didn't work all it did was annoy me um yeah because the uh, the seat in the in the UK black taxis isn't particularly designed to have something else put in it um so but the thing that worked best for him in terms of dealing with these contextual factors is I told him that you know basically what you want to do is how long would you sit before you get out of your taxi. And he would say, oh, I'd sit for two or three hours sometimes without getting out because in Edinburgh it rains a lot. And he said, well, what I want you to do is every time a new fare, a new passenger gets in or out, if you get out of the cab, out of your door and go and open the door, or close the door for them, at least you're getting out of this, you get it, stand up, you walk around and come back, that's gonna make a big difference. Uh, and within a week he came back with it, saying that that's the best thing I've ever done. You know, my back ache at the end of the day is a lot better. And I'm getting um, I'm getting nearly a hundred pounds a week in tips increasing because Edinburgh's a city with lots of American tourists and the American no, not anymore apparently <laughs> but Edinburgh's a city with lots of American tourists and the Americans tourists tip quite a bit so the fact that he was getting out and opening and closing the door for them helping with their bag um, he was getting more tips than he'd ever had in his life so he said that's going to motivate him to keep doing that forever. <laughs> Okay, so that's that's just an example of that this three diagnosis system for John the Tax Driver. Well, he's quite a simple, uh, straightforward um, um, cons uh, example of this um, sight and direction problem, but giving us the three diagnoses here. <laughs>